Corium, perhaps the world's most dangerous synthetic substance, has been created on accident five times. Once at Three Mile Island, once in Chernobyl, and three separate times at Fukushima Daiichi. Each nuclear meltdown had the same failure modes and the same fuel. So why was the outcome of each so different? After a nuclear meltdown, what determines the fate of the surrounding environment? And once you identify what the problem is, how do you deal with it? A nuclear meltdown occurs when fissile material in a critical configuration heats itself up to its melting point. It's the worst case scenario for any nuclear power plant or facility. A meltdown is only dangerous, however, if it makes contact with the environment. A reactor core can partially melt down and be safely contained, as happened at the US's experimental breeder reactor Fermi-1 in 1966, for example. When a melting core is not contained, potential environmental contamination comes from two sources, fallout and fuel. During normal operation, a nuclear reactor uses uranium fuel pellets placed in rods to maintain innumerable instances of nuclear fission. This process splits the uranium atom into two new radioactive atoms, or fission products. Sustained fission in a reactor, therefore, will deplete uranium over time, more fission products than uranium nuclei in the fuel rods. This is why nuclear fuel is moved from the center of a core to the edge as it gets less useful for reactions, then to a spent fuel pool, then to recycling if applicable, then finally to cask storage. The critical fact here is that during a nuclear meltdown, uncooled uranium oxide reaches its melting point of many thousands of degrees. But the boiling point of the fission products that have gradually built up in the fuel is not many thousands of degrees, and so radionuclides like xenon, iodine, cesium, and strontium vaporize out of the uranium. They become gases and can escape into the environment. Xenon stays a gas and decays quickly, as happened at Three Mile Island, and so is the least harmful escapee. Vaporized iodine, cesium, and strontium, on the other hand, will condense and become solid again once they escape the meltdown's high temperatures and then fall out as contamination. The fission products released this way in the highest amount with the longest half-life are isotopes of cesium. And so cesium-134 and 137, after they boil out of melting uranium, condense in the atmosphere and fall out to the ground as microscopic particulate, are the most dangerous fission products in terms of environmental contamination. It's mainly cesium that blankets many, many square kilometers of Japan and Ukraine. While cesium fallout links the world's worst nuclear disasters, one disaster differed in a critical way. Not only did cesium particulate make it out of Chernobyl's reactor number four, but also the fuel that produced those fission products. That was released to the environment too, explosively. Fukushima had multiple reactor meltdowns. Reactor buildings even exploded, but the innards of the reactors themselves weren't part of those explosions. The cores weren't fully exposed, the containment buildings remained mostly intact, doing exactly what they were designed to do. Unlike modern Japanese nuclear plants, however, there was no containment building for Chernobyl's Reactor 4. And so after two massive explosions, an estimated 6,000 kilograms of the core itself was flung outside the building and then carried thousands of meters into the atmosphere by a multi-day inferno of burning graphite. This immense eruption of steam, fire, and fuel is why contamination left Ukraine, but didn't leave Japan. Indeed, experts still don't fully agree on how large the explosions that released Chernobyl's fuel actually were, or even how they happened. Because the core itself exploded, 75% of the total ground contamination in the Chernobyl exclusion zone is not actually fallout. It's extremely radioactive and microscopic shards of fuel from 1986, so-called hot particles. These are what make Chernobyl the world's worst nuclear disaster. If I was scared about anything during my time in Chernobyl, and there wasn't much, 
an easily inhaled metallic sliver that could irradiate my lungs for months was it. And I did in fact encounter a splinter of decades old uranium during a training exercise back in 2021. Locating it was relatively easy, if you know what you're doing. If you were looking for a hot particle, how would you find it? In a grossly contaminated environment like Pripyat, your Geiger counter is constantly beeping. A hot particle will necessarily be hotter than some moss that's taking up cesium-137, for example, but locating one in a large area is the equivalent of finding a nuclear needle in a haystack. So the first thing you do is search for a hotspot with your decimeter. Once you have your suspected hotspot, the next thing that you do is gather up that material and do fractioning. Now, fractioning is something I learned from Tom Clausen, who led us through Chernobyl and who we work with on the Dogs of Chernobyl program. Note that I do not have a hot particle here in this material. It is a small piece of uranium ore for demonstration purposes. Now, when we fraction this material, what we're gonna do in reality is split it into halves and then measure each half with our dosimeter. The idea being that if each half remains the same, no matter how many times we divide it, it speaks to more distributed contamination like cesium-137 fallout and not a hot particle. But if we split it and one side is much hotter than the other, then maybe it is a hot particle. So let's do that. There it is, our hot particle. Note that in a place like Chernobyl, this would be much, much smaller and much, much hotter. What was really sobering back in 2021 when we actually did this training exercise was that I could not even see the tiny metal sliver that was maxing out our Geiger counters. It's right there, producing thousands of counts per minute. In Japan, the cores themselves did not explode, and so it's very unlikely that hot particles are strewn about the environment. Even so, we did test for them while we were there. What we've been doing so far is following the environment and trying to find where gross contamination might accumulate or not. But here at this shrine, we may have found something else, a hot particle, an actual particulate of fuel or some other fission product that was vaporized out of the melting down cores at Fukushima Daiichi. And we get that sense we got an idea that this might be a hot area. I would guess, following where the moss is going, where the water might be flowing if it starts raining, we know that moss takes up a lot of nutrients in the environment, it's very good at doing that. And you can hear the difference. Almost can't tell the difference between the beeps high enough that some of the experts we're with think that this might be a location of a hot particle. The other possibility is that moss, as we know, is a good bioaccumulator. As it sends out its tendrils looking for nutrients and water, it tends to sap up everything on the surface or on the substrate that it is on. We saw the same thing as we we're walking through Pripyat where even on a concrete surface, we'd be able to take some moss, look at the back of it, and get a very high reading, like we're getting right here. So, is it a hot particle? Is it bioaccumulation? That's something that we actually have to glove up for, go in, and see for ourselves. <laughs> 
pretty even distribution here at the sample material. Mm -hmm. The suspected hot particle wasn't. Each fraction of the moths from the statue read more or less the same, meaning that a more distributed contamination was more likely. It's a result further backed up by the physics of the meltdowns at Daiichi. The Fukushima, Chernobyl, and Three Mile Island disasters prove that not all nuclear meltdowns are created equal. Each was dominated by one of the three classes of contaminants. In Pennsylvania, small amounts of short-lived krypton and xenon gases were emitted, and so the environmental effects were basically non-existent, despite what activists may claim. In Japan, cores were destroyed but did not explode. The fuel stayed put, and so only condensed isotopes of cesium and other fission products escaped in a radioactive plume that contaminated the countryside. In Ukraine, in addition to fission products that a massive fire propelled across Europe, actual pieces of fuel, hot particles, were shot skyward and fell out within a few dozen kilometers of the power plant, owing to their size. Three different disasters, each with their own remediation or decontamination and cleanup challenges. Challenges made that much harder by the disproportionate fear the public has for anything nuclear. Cleaning up a nuclear meltdown is, in theory, relatively simple. If fission products and or hot particles have dusted a known area, you spray down, cover over, dig up, and contain that area. But in practice, that is a monumental undertaking. Imagine that just one square kilometer of land is contaminated, not very much at all. And let's say the decided upon remediation or cleanup tactic is to remove the top 10 centimeters of soil. The depth isn't much, but it rapidly adds up. Even this small patch of land would create hundreds of millions of kilograms of material that has to be contained, moved, monitored, stored. Case in point, innumerable black bags of radioactive soil, together totaling the mass of 400 fully loaded Titanics, have been piling up in roadside pyramids across Fukushima. The estimated cost of all this is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. And after a decade, the Japanese government is still struggling to find a final resting place for all of the contaminated material. The difficulty of cleaning up a contaminated site is directly proportional to how clean a government or agency requires an area to be. A zero or extremely low tolerance policy for radiation might make sense to the public and to most lawmakers, but it's arguable that because most regulations are based on the so-called linear no-threshold model, the biophysical theory that any amount of radiation will have health effects, remediation efforts in a place like Fukushima are far more difficult and expensive than they ought to be. For example, despite public perception, the actual radiation levels right now in most of Fukushima's evacuated areas are no greater than the natural background radiation rates all over the world. And so, the Japanese government moving hundreds of millions of kilograms of soil while displacing 160,000 people could be seen as an immense, unnecessary, and even deadly cost. But we will cover that in detail later in the series. Remediation is also made more difficult by the fact that no environment is static. Winds blow, waters run, life consumes and collects and colonizes. Microscopic fission product particles and pieces of fuel can ride any of these pathways, following the ebb and flow of nature. And it's why the bellies of Chernobyl's dogs are more contaminated than their backs, and why pavement collects less contamination than leaf clutter. Knowing how the local environment lives and breathes is the best way to find where nuclear contamination has collected, or will collect. I spent the majority of my time in Fukushima learning to locate contamination this way. Here on the road, we have a Geiger counter. It says 0 0.2, 0 0.1, thereabouts. And that wouldn't indicate to me any real sizable danger, not that I should leave the area or anything like that. But now, considering the environment, where would the contamination actually go if it was building up over 10 years? Well, looking at where the water would flow downhill, it would be collecting in a place 
probably off to the side of the road, maybe where this greenery is growing, indicating where the water is flowing. So now if we're at something like point two, let me just place it right here where I think the environment would put it. I find a reading almost three to four times higher in just the span of a meter. What the environment is doing with contamination can be almost as important as the contamination itself. We are consistently seeing in areas like this is that the concrete in these contaminated areas is gathering and accumulating contamination. Why? My hypothesis is a surface of concrete can be incredibly porous, meaning that on the microscopic and nanoscopic levels, you have an immense amount of surface area. So think of the difference between this with all its millions of little pits and pockets versus a perfectly smooth pane of glass. If you had water running down that pane of glass, you wouldn't expect a lot of particulate matter to settle out of it. However, this is like going through a two-dimensional sieve, and over time, over 10 years now after the disaster, that contamination might begin to build up. That's exactly what's happened. I'm going to be honest with you. Before I made this program, I didn't actually know how nuclear contamination escaped a meltdown. I only knew that it did. While the vaporization of fission products might be obvious to some engineer or other expert, they weren't in any popular retelling of a meltdown that I've ever read, and so my understanding was challenged and updated. And now I want to challenge you. Could misunderstanding or not knowing fully the intricacies of a nuclear meltdown actually be more harmful than the meltdown itself? Could the cost of cleaning up Fukushima be too high? Was the evacuation of Fukushima in the first place even worth it? Those answers, next time.